you a fan of this podcast? Do you wish there was even more juicy content for you to sink your ears into? Well, there is. You can become a premium member of this podcast for $5.99 a month and get full access to an archive of over 50 bonus episodes. Additionally, we release a bonus episode every single month. That's a ton of extra content, including my personal interior design diaries, extra tips, my talking about trends, and so much more. Additionally, you'll be keeping us on the airwaves each and every week because your premium membership money goes directly back to making this podcast amazing. Check us out at affordableinteriordesign.com, click on podcast to learn more and to become a premium member today. need a high-end designer or a lot of money to get a luxe look be your own interior designer this is affordable interior design the podcast here's your host betsy hellman hi guys it is great to be with you once again this week i hope things are going well you know just uh real quickly i'm gonna give my husband a shout out he has a new podcast i think he was probably inspired by me But he has a new podcast called Questionable Material. He and his friend Brian Sack record it once a week. And if you like humor, well, this could be the podcast for you. So they're not going to talk about furniture or paint or any of that amazing stuff. But they talk about politics, pop culture. It's very funny. And tune in if you uh, just want to hear more from my family. Once again, that is Questionable Material by Jack Helmuth and Brian Sack. All right, without further ado, I'm not going to plug anything else. I'm just going to hop right into your questions. The first question is from Irina. Irina writes, Hi, Betsy. I've been thinking about remodeling my bedroom and I thought about your podcast. Over the last few years, you've been very helpful. So I would love to hear your advice. I sure need help. This is my bedroom. We haven't done much to it since we moved in. I plan to paint the walls to a grayish blue and buy new bed with new nightstands. The ceiling is eight feet high. We have a king size bed and the new bed is going to be king size as well. We love having space when we sleep. But as you can tell, there is not much space in the room for anything else. There's a double closet on the left and two doors on the other side. My question is, would a large headboard make the bed look too large for this space? I always thought large headboards look nice. For an eight feet ceiling, do you recommend either an art piece or a headboard or both? I would like to stay away from art, but then I don't have an inspiration piece and I'm afraid a headboard cannot serve as one since typically they're neutral or just one color. All right, well, you have lots of other questions. So let me answer that one first, Irina. First of all, all beds, whether you're in a super tiny room or a super big room, All beds need a headboard. Without a headboard, when it's just a mattress on a frame, well, it looks stormtastic. It looks really transient. It does not look chic at all. I don't want your pillows leaning on your wall. Certainly, I don't want them falling behind the bed. A headboard is essential. All you need for a headboard is three inches. You can have a headboard that attaches onto the metal bed frame. Those run you less than $150. You can, of course, have a complete bed that has a headboard with a frame. Oftentimes, those do add about six inches to the square footage of the footprint, right? But it's essential. I don't care how small your bedroom is. You must, must, must have a headboard. Sometimes people even have headboards because their room is so small or due to other restrictions that attach to the wall and don't even attach to the bed. And that is, while not totally desirable, okay with me. Eight-foot ceilings are standard, so there's nothing really restrictive about that. The only thing you wouldn't be able to do because you have eight-foot ceilings is do any kind of chandelier. In order to have any kind of fixture that drops from the ceiling, that hangs down, that's not a flush mount, in other words, you'll need at least nine feet. But don't feel restricted by the height. 
Now, I typically do put a piece of artwork above the headboard when the headboard is a standard height. A standard height headboard is around 45 inches. Something like 65 starts to be kind of a significant height, and anything over 65 is really high, and you probably will not need an art piece above that at all. Even at 65, I would recommend an art piece that's pretty low, like 24 inches or less, because you don't want that art practically touching the ceiling. And you want between four and seven inches between the headboard and the bottom of the art. Typically, above a king-size bed that has a standard height headboard of 45 inches or so, I would do a horizontal piece of art that's 30 by 40 inches. That goes really well with my ratio of having it be 50 to 75% of the piece that it's above, the width of the art that is. And it's just a really good ratio. It's a good look. It doesn't get too close to the ceiling. That's my general advice. Now guys, if you hear me stumbling and bumbling a bit, it is because I am recovering from food poisoning. I'm one day out. I'm barely hanging on. I've got a bottle of water over here trying to stay hydrated and keep it together. But I couldn't go a week without giving you an episode. So here I am, straight from the toilet bowl to you. Was that TMI? See, I'm a couple screws loose after not eating for a day and a half. All right, let me get to your next question. You mentioned the inspiration piece. Yes, well, typically a headboard does not count as an inspiration piece because as you referenced, typically they are neutral or a solid color. However, you don't have to rely on artwork for your inspiration piece. I see that you have room for a nice large area rug. I see that you have windows that accommodate drapes. Either one of those could make perfect inspiration pieces. Then you continue to write. If the headboard is a no-go for a room like this, how large should the art be to look balanced for a king-size bed? Well, I just answered that. I was also thinking about wallpaper behind the bed, but the wall is so texturized, I'm afraid that it wouldn't stick or it would look sloppy. That's right. If your wall has a lot of texture, wallpaper is probably not going to work well for you, or it would need to be a very thick paper, and the texture of the wall would need to be very fine. Uh, even then, I think it's dubious. You really need a smooth wall for decent wallpaper application. Then you end your note by saying, thank you for so much for everything you do. Your help you help, excuse me, confused and indecisive people like me bring comfort and beauty to our home. Well, good. I am so glad to hear that, Irina. That is why I do this week after week, food poisoning or no. I come to the airwaves to speak to you and hopefully make your lives a little better. All right, let's talk to Marissa. Marissa writes, Hi, Betsy. When you have time on an upcoming podcast, would you share your thoughts on the best way to stack and layer rugs? best uses and how to choose textures that will go well together, and also your thoughts on the company Ruggable. Would it be a good option for kids or is it a marketing gimmick that you can wash your rug? Cheers, Marissa. All right, let me start at the top. So stacking and layering rugs. It is a really cute look in a magazine. It's a really nice look on a blog. I don't find it to be super practical. However, there are some best practices. So one of the best practices is that the rug on the bottom needs to be very low pile. It needs to be a flat or mat style rug. And by low pile, I mean 0.25 inches in pile height or less. Because you're going to layer another rug on top of it and you don't want that rug shifting around. You want it to fit closely to that lower pile rug. Now, the rug that you pile on top can have a very shaggy texture. It could be a flocati rug, which is very furry. It could be a shag rug. It could just be a normal pile height rug at around 0.5 inches high. But um, you want to make sure that you're layering them in such a way that's really dynamic. Maybe instead of just layering one over the other sort of... Um, so that they kind of align or make somewhat of a donut where there's a border of the flatter rug around the plush inner rug that's smaller. Maybe instead you'd layer it at a diagonal. 
Or maybe you do something that's not a rectangular rug at all. Maybe you do something irregular like a um, zebra skin rug. You know, they make a lot of faux ones. So you can get that cool outline without actually killing a zebra. But they do have cowhide rugs as well that have that really cool outline. And layering that on top of a flat weave rug I think would be awesome. The reason I don't typically layer rugs is because as you're walking through the space, as your guests are walking through the space, while they're going to be prone to catch their toe under that top rug, it may even become somewhat of a hazard because typically under every rug, I would do a rug pad. There are lots of types of rug pads out there, but I myself prefer a felt rug pad because it adds plushness as well as helping the rug to stay close to the floor and not have the edges curl up. Additionally, it can be sound dampening if you live in an apartment. So a felt style rug pad is really always my go-to. But of course, you'll have that felt style rug pad under that low profile rug on the bottom, but you can't do it under the second rug on the top and so that might shift around it might constantly be moving people might be tripping on the edges and that's why I don't generally do it sure you could tape the edges down with rug tape or something like that so that they adhere to the rug below but that sounds like a lot of work anyway uh, the next question you ask is about the company Ruggable. So Ruggable is a relatively new company that sells very flat style rugs that can go in your washing machine. Even large rugs, which was kind of shocking to me. So I did do some research on the website because the idea of a rug that you can wash in a washing machine is so compelling, especially because many of my clients have kids or pets or are a little bit spill prone like me, and it just sounds like such a good idea. That being said, when I look at the reviews online, they are not good. So I last time I checked, which is about two months ago, I discovered that people are complaining that the patterns fade after the first washing, that the texture doesn't look quite right. I myself have not had firsthand experience with Ruggable, and as I mentioned, I'm super intrigued. But buyer beware, I'm not going to recommend these for my clients or certainly buy one for myself until those reviews improve. There we go, Marissa. All right, let me get to my next question. This listener writes hi betsy i just downloaded your book to my kindle i'm designing a house from scratch that will be built in early 2021 to my desires and besides designing the layout i'm also thinking about the interior since the house itself will already cost a fortune there is not going to be a lot of money left over to purchase new furniture in terms of styling a home i've always felt that i can't do it right and didn't know why your book and podcast i'm at episode 92 are very helpful so far. I do have some questions though. I'm already struggling with determining my style. When I look at different pictures of styles, I can not tell which one is which. They seem to overlap in certain areas. When I'm looking at pictures of different styles, I'm rather drawn to dark rooms with strong colors, but I do love rustic elements as well as bling and plush pieces. I'm pretty positive these could go well together. I'm just not sure what to call it. Glamorous industrial maybe? All right, so you have lots more questions to go, but I'm going to stop you right here because you may be listening to the podcast. You may have the book, but you are not taking in these lessons because if you were, you would know that glamorous industrial is not okay. I'm going to want you to use my two-word phrase method, which you can read about in the book, and you'll hear me talk about a little bit on this podcast. I want your ears to perk up when I do, because you may not have two styles in one room. You can only have one style per room, and so my two-word phrase method, one word is that style word, the second word is how you want to feel in the space, and then... For those of you who really deeply listen, and maybe for those of you in my academy, well, you know that there's actually a third word I always add to the end of that, which is sophisticated. And this is my litmus test. When I pick up a piece or when I'm online shopping, if it doesn't align with my one style word, my one feeling word, and if it's not sophisticated, if I can't check 
one of those feeling word or style word boxes plus sophisticated box, it doesn't go in the room. Now, I myself like lots of styles. And when I built, well, I didn't build it. When I bought my dream house, maybe I'm just a little envious that you're building your dream house. Oh, man. But when I bought my dream house, I gave different rooms different styles. That way, I could embrace my love of the transitional in my bedroom. I could show off my passion for mid-century in my living room. That way, I could really pivot like I want to, right? And that's going to be my recommendation for you because glam industrial is not going to work out. Now, I could see you fusing like soft rustic. I think that would be a great uh, two-word phrase because soft is how you want it to feel. Maybe everything should feel comfortable, like a soothing, cozy sanctuary, But rustic will give you some of those elements that you're kind of lumping in with industrial, that live edge wood, the unfinished metals that kind of have an aged patina. I think that might be the way to go. In fact, I have, I think I had called it soft rustic or something like that in my book. So look for it because it's one of the examples I gave. And we did like this really furry plush pillow right next to an oil rub bronze, very industrial in table. You'll see that layering there because what's so fun about the two word phrase method is the more different those words are, the more compelling the design will be. Rustic is normally hard. People normally think of it as very hard and jagged. So incorporating soft as your feeling word is a total 180, right? And that could make the room quite interesting if you're constantly layering industrial, soft, industrial, or rustic, right? We're kind of using those interchangeably in this moment, but I would want you to commit to either industrial or rustic as you're creating your phrase. And now it's time for a quick commercial break. Do you love this podcast? Do you wish you could learn even more? Well, we have an online class bundle. Our online class bundle is comprised of three online classes, Beautifying Your Home for Less, Styling Your Home, and The Fundamentals of Feng Shui. Each one of those three classes is between 30 and 45 minutes long and chock filled with visuals and tips things that will help you to style your own space or help out with other spaces. Additionally, with the pack of three classes, you get an autographed copy of my book, Affordable Interior Design. You get all of that for only $99. Once again, that's the three online classes as well as the book for only $99. You just go to affordableinteriordesign.com slash classes. Once again, affordableinteriordesign.com slash classes to buy your bundle today. And if one of those classes sounded intriguing, but maybe you already have my book or some of the other topics are not of interest, you can buy the classes individually at that site as well. Each class is $40. So head over to affordableinteriordesign.com slash classes to get your bundle or your online class today. All right, here we go. You go on. I'm also thinking about the 60-30-10 rule. In my house, there will be a large open living dining cooking bar area, and I'm not 100% sure how to style it. My favorite color is teal. I have some of the walls in my rental apartment painted in dark teal. It's similar to Benjamin Moore's bow green, and I just love it. Since you say that accent walls are a no-no, I'm planning to paint the whole area in my house to be that color. There will be a lot of large windows, so I don't think it'll be too much and that will be my 60% color. The kitchen will be matte black, Ikea's Kungsbaka, and I wanna make it look like a modern saloon. I have this nude low-key photograph of me wearing just a a cowboy hat, hello, (laughs) hello, which is printed on brushed aluminum and copper tones, plus I have a lot of accessories like horse memorabilia, etc. And I really think that a golden floor, not bright gold, but more of a muted bronze would look awesome. I'm planning to add more of that matte black in terms of a metal to showcase and metal bookshelves. So this black, is it a neutral or does it count as a color? Okay, first of all, 
let me just say, Tanya, Tanya, you have got a lot of look going on here. I love that you're going bold and using that nude photograph of you. It sounds like you're putting it in a very public space, which is a kitchen. Of course, it's your kitchen, so you decide who you invite in there, but hello. Um, I love this really extreme look, not just the nude photo but also the teal wall color, the black cabinets. But you want to be careful that it does not become a theme room because what I'm hearing, especially when you started throwing around that word saloon, is that this could easily become a theme room. And even if it ticks off that feeling word and that style word, it's not going to tick off that sophisticated word. And it's not going to inspire your guests, maybe even yourself, to say, wow, this looks so designerly. Instead, it may start to look over the top, especially when you added that golden floor. I mean, I'm glad that this is a podcast and not yet my affordable interior design TV, which is coming next month, because you can't see right now that my eyes are bulging out of my head trying to envision gold floors, jewel-toned teal walls, a nude photograph of you and a, a cowboy hat, and saloon doors or saloon memorabilia with horses. Wow. Oh, wow. It's a lot of look. That being said... You can choose to use black as a 60-30 tin or as a neutral, but I will warn you that you're also using that really saturated teal color. I don't want this room to become super dark. I want it to feel fresh and contemporary. So think about that a little bit because you go on to say that there's more dark coming in here. You say, then I have some dark brown furniture, dining table, armchair, coffee tables that need to stay. Same question here, is this neutral or a color? Typically, a wood tone does not count as a color unless it's painted wood. So if it was painted white, if it was painted navy, if it was painted your favorite, teal. But if it's a wood tone, it's not going to count as one of your 60, 30, 10. Right now, I'm definitely hearing that that teal is going to be your 60 because it's a wall color. You could choose if the black is a 30, but I think that's going to be way too dark. I think you need to bring in some lighter tones to infuse this space with uh, some levity. Oh my gosh. All right. And then you go on to say, I'd like to repeat that golden color in some way. Could this be my 10% or my 30%? Then I'd like to add some burgundy. Oh my gosh, I'm exhausted. My brain is so exhausted decorating this room as I'm reading it. I'm like, whoa, it's still a lot of look. So again, I love that you're mixing warm with the cool. Both that burgundy, which is a shade of red, and that golden color will, of course, count as warm colors. But I want you to make sure that this palette stays sophisticated. I would say in order to avoid it becoming too dark, because burgundy is a very dark color, even golden is a very dark shade of yellow. But my inclination would be 30% gold, 10% burgundy, if you're tied to this color palette of dark teal, gold, and burgundy. Can you hear my uh, hesitation? Maybe think that one through a little bit more. Then you continue. I want to get Ikea's Soderman couch. My mom has that couch and I love it. I always have my feet up on the couch, not the floor. So I do like that extra wide seat. But which color should I get? There are companies who sell fitting covers in all colors for Ikea. I know you always suggest a neutral, but I'm sort of drawn to burgundy. Well, Tanya, you are sort of drawn to a lot of things, and it is making my head spin. You better slow down. You better add a neutral. Give that IKEA couch a neutral cover and think of some other places you can add neutral to. All right, you continue. Also, I'd like to have some burgundy in the kitchen area, maybe the back wall. I think this would go well with the picture and the black in the kitchen as well. Wow. Well, maybe some little pops, right? So maybe it's canisters on the countertop for coffee, tea, flour. Maybe it's dish towels that are burgundy. Maybe not a burgundy backsplash or anything more significant than small 10% pops. And then you finish up saying, in terms of rustic slash industrial, I want to add lamps in that style. Maybe even do a wall in brick. What do you think? Greetings from Germany, Tanya. 
Well, Tanya, I think you have so many amazing ideas. I think you're cr- trying to cram a house full of amazing ideas into one area. And I think that's a big misstep. I think you should judiciously edit all these ideas and make that big open space much more focused. Then in say your master, you could go more industrial or maybe in a guest room, you could go more glam. I do warn against the idea of brick if it wasn't intrinsic to your home's architecture. I do not like faux or fake anything. So faux brick is going to be a no-go for me. Tanya, thank you for sending in this letter because while I feel a little bit overwhelmed by the amount of colors and ideas here, I'm also inspired. So many of my clients are afraid of color. So many of my clients are afraid to go bold. So when I'm talking to somebody who is unafraid, it is always refreshing. Guys, I'm going to leave you on that note. I hope that you're having a week that is bold and unafraid. I'm going to take just half of Tanya's cojones and use it to rally as I recover from my food poisoning. All right, guys, until next week. Bye. You've asked for it, and we have answered the call. For years, you've been saying, Betsy, you're talking about all these great design concepts, but we can't visualize them. You're describing the picture that the listener sent in of their problem, and we wish we could see that picture too. After all, a picture is worth a thousand words, and I do my best to describe them, but there's nothing like seeing it for yourself. And that's why Affordable Interior Design, the podcast, now has a YouTube channel. Not only do we have a YouTube channel where you could see recordings and clips of these podcast episodes, we also have an Instagram, a Facebook, and so many other exciting things. You should check it out. Head over to affordableinteriordesign.com slash links. Once again, affordableinteriordesign.com slash L-I-N-K-S links. And when you go there, you will see links to our YouTube page, our Instagram page, our Facebook page, and more. Please check it out. Follow and subscribe so you can see everything I'm talking about. A big thank you to our amazing producer, Catherine Heller, to Aton and the MBCR House Band, and to Affordable Interior Design, the sponsor of this podcast and the premier place to get an amazing look on a budget. Check out affordableinteriordesign.com. If you guys love the show, the very best way to support us is by spreading the word. Tell your friends or write us an awesome review on iTunes. So until next week, guys, thanks so much for joining us, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.